Huge middle dog. Hi guys. Well, it is an exciting Saturday night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. Uh, it's Saturday night in Chickamauga, Georgia, where the little dog and I have washed up. Yes, in Chickamauga, Georgia. It's um, finally for the first time in a couple of days making it over here to uh, my little box here. And uh, I noticed that, uh, good Lord, how many of you have sent me this article? But of course, I think I put this article back in the queue before I ever left Texas. And this is for the second time in a week I am returning to this little lefty site called Truth Dig. And uh, I admit, like a lot of you, I had a falling out with Truth Dig a couple of years ago with all of that rigmarole with them firing Chris Hedges and all that. But I guess they've served their time. And uh, Truth Dig, for the second time this week, has, uh, I, I have to say, despite that little kerfuffle with Chris Hedges and Robert Shearer and the guys, uh, I've got to say, good for Truth Dig for bringing out this uh, essay from this fellow, Emil P. Torres. Uh, never heard of Emil Torres, The Bright Side of Extinction. There you go, the bright side of extinction, and I am going to uh, put the link on here and uh, encourage you to read this whole thing because uh, this is some, it, it is a great piece of doomer porn, but unfortunately, it would take me till midnight to read this all so I am simply we're gonna dive in as much as I hate to do this guys because I'm really skipping over some good Saturday night doomer porn but we are going to probably get into the uh, the last maybe one-third to one-half uh, so Roughly, he's talking about, uh, you know, first he's talking about this group of folks called long-termist, don't you? Which is his words for these clueless uh, moron apocaloptimists, or not even apocaloptimists, just these optimists that humans are going to figure this out, that everything is rosy on the planet, that humanity is happier and in better shape than they've ever been before and the future is so bright that uh, we've got to wear shades so he he uh, spends the you know time the people not seeing the advantage in human extinction but then uh, we're gonna come in as I say half to two-thirds of the way through and pick it up here after uh, visiting some apocaloptimist. Uh, we're going to start with a question. But will the future be better? The evidence overwhelmingly implies that the climate catastrophe will inflict untold suffering on billions. Scientists predict a constellation of world-shattering effects such as huge hurricanes, mega droughts, devastating famines, massive wildfires, lethal heat waves, large migrations of desperate climate refugees, the collapse of ecosystems, social upheaval, political instability, disastrous wars, and even more, apocalyptic terrorism. The effects of climate change are furthermore expected to linger not for decades or centuries, but for the next ten millennia, a longer period of time than, quote, civilization 
has so far existed, in the midst of all this, studies suggest that humanity will need to produce more food in the coming 100 years than it has throughout all of history, and fights over dwindling resources could significantly increase the probability of a nuclear exchange. And that is just climate change. Thank you very much for recognizing that that is just climate change. And so even if you don't even stir climate change into the equation, as Book Hermit does not, and, and I don't really, uh, at least for another few years, that is just climate change. The potential for even worse suffering is foregrounded by the possibility of advanced technologies. Oppressive governments could potentially read our minds, control our thoughts, implement invasive mass surveillance systems, and even develop life extension technologies that enable them to keep torture victims alive and screaming for hundreds or thousands of years. I honestly don't know if he's being sarcastic there or, or not. The future here on Earth is not a pretty sight, which is why some people envision colonizing other planets like Mars. Yet, as Daniel Dudenay shows in his book Dark Skies, the result of this could be even worse catastrophes as Earth and its Martian colonies would likely engage in power struggles that could precipitate yet more untold suffering. David Benatar himself, now he talks a lot about this fellow David Benatar, this famous anti-natalist, um, this famous anti-natalist, so that's what he's talking about. <clears throat> David Benatar himself doesn't make, the, doesn't make these future-oriented arguments, but a Benatarian, or someone who accepts his view, definitely could. Benatar is far from the first to claim that life is very bad and the world is hell. The, this idea goes back to at least all Arthur Schopenhauer, a 19th century German philosopher who once believed that an honest look at the world justifies the conclusion that it would have been better if Earth had remained as lifeless as the moon. In fact, Schopenhauer's pessimism has inspired generations of philosophers. Another German philosopher named Edward von Hartmann contended that not only would being extinct be better than existence, but that we should, ev that we should eventually bring about our own extin extinction. He never said how we should do this. Instead, arguing that as culture continues to develop, a means would eventually be discovered. Like just about every other pessimist, Hartman was not in favor of what scholars would now call omnicide, where someone or some group takes it upon themselves to kill everyone else. These pessimists would see this as an abomination, as something truly evil. After all, causing everyone to die would probably entail enormous suffering, and suffering is precisely what they don't want. For Hartman, I like this guy, for Hartman, 
an appropriate means of, you know, humans going voluntarily extinct with no suffering involved is what we're talking about here. For Hartman, an appropriate means would gradually come into view, which, while for Benatar, the only morally permissible route from our present state of existence to the blessed calm of nothingness, in Schopenhauer's words, is refusing to have children. Uh, for Hartman, an appropriate means would gradually come into view the only morally permissible route is refusing to have children any other way of precipitating our extinction would be completely unacceptable. Huh, imagine that. Yet another philosopher who Schopenhauer inspired is Peter Wessel Zapf, Z-A-P-F-F-E, Zapf. In his poetic article, The Last Messiah, uh, published in 1933, he argued that humanity is kind of like the Irish elk. I mean, anyway, we're not going to go into that. Okay, uh, he talks about that. Zapfe argues that we hold this cosmic panic at bay through various defense mechanisms such as isolation and diversion. The first involves hiding from others and from ourselves our true thoughts about the terror of being alive. We simply don't allow ourselves to speak honestly about the predicament of life. We keep this concealed and so do others with the unspoken norm, otherwise the stock answer of the normies, the unspoken norm of answering, yes, I'm fine, when someone asks, how are you doing? The second is more obvious, you know, diversion and increasingly pervasive in our world of Twitter, TikTok, and TV, we distract ourselves from the reality of existence. If our eyes are fixated on the screen, we cannot be looking into the void. Yes, the void. The voice of existential dread. Yes. What happened... Uh, anyway, we're going back to skipping ahead. In Zapfi's view, we are always teetering on the edge of this state, incessantly and desperately isolating and distracting ourselves. These mechanisms are indeed the only reason that humanity was, quote, not wiped out long ago in great raging epidemics of insanity. The solution, Zapfi argues, is the same reached by Benatar. Quoting this fellow Zapfi, Know thyselves, be unfruitful. There you go. Be unfruitful and let there be peace on earth after thy passing. Close quote. Practicing what he preached, Zapfi chose to be childless for his 90 years on this planet. Thank you, sir. I cannot believe it. Uh, I have never heard of this man. I'm 63 years old. I have chosen to be childless. This is practicing what I preach. All of these clueless morons uh, claiming, you know, that anybody favoring human extinction 
through not breeding is a hypocrite for not killing themselves. I have been preaching for how many years practice voluntary human extinction by not breeding. Like this old man, I practice what I preach. I chose not to breed, to let there be peace on earth after by passing. I uh, cannot believe I'm just hearing uh, about this man at age 63. Anyway, the same conclusions, hmm, the same conclusions could be arrived at from a rather different angle, environmentalism. Now, uh, I would say doomerism. Uh, that 99.9% uh, .9 of mainstream environmentalists are not reaching the conclusion that human extinction is the best thing for the environment of planet Earth. This is a tiny, tiny uh, percentage of environmentalists reaching this inescapable conclusion there is one solution to what's going on on this planet and that is for humans to go extinct by not breeding. Anyway, getting back to uh, Emil's uh, essay. There is no denying, there is no denying that Homo sapiens, which somewhat ironically means wise human is responsible for an enormous amount of harm to our fellow creatures on earth. We have raised forests, obliterated ecosystems, and pushed many species out of existence. We are a rampaging juggernaut of destruction single-handedly initiating the sixth major mass extinction event in the 3.8 billion year history of life on this planet. The last one being the extinction of the dinosaurs some 66 million years ago. Our impact, otherwise humans impact, has been so immense that if alien intelligences were to discover our planet in five million years, assuming that we no longer exist then, they would see a marked decrease in biodiversity within the geological record beginning around the Industrial Revolution. Alarmed by this finding, their scientists would conclude that something terrible had happened, something on par with a giant asteroid slamming into Earth, which is how the dinosaurs died out. This is why some environmentalists, such as Les Unite, I have, you can find my interview with Les Unite, have argued that we should phase out the human species by collectively refusing to procreate. In 1993, Knight founded a community which I am a card-carrying member of, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, or VHEMT, to promote this idea and continues his activism up to the present. And I just have to brag on myself, I have the highest uh, honor and award by the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, and that is if you voluntarily got yourself sterilized before ever having your first child. We are the proud owners of the Golden Snip Award. I am a proud uh, I have been awarded the Golden Snip Award by VHEMT for getting myself sterilized before bringing one other human being 
onto this planet by practicing what I preach. Back to the uh, back to the essay. The probability that most people around the world will voluntarily stop having kids, though, is approximately zero. Hmm. Far more likely is that humanity, you know, for because they would not stop having kids voluntarily, far more likely, like 100% more likely, is that humanity will succumb to a horrendous catastrophe of its own creation, a nuclear war, global pandemic involving designer pathogens, or perhaps even an AI takeover. If the AI doomers are right, such an event would be truly terrible, as once again everyone above would agree. Yet, these philosophers would also rush to reassure us that this would not be all bad. The resulting outcome of their being nor no more humans would mean no more human suffering and no more human-caused evils in the world. At long last, the flood of hurt in which so many people are treading water would subside, and surely that would be better, or so they would argue. I am 100% one of these philosophers. I guess I never realized that I was such a philosopher. I just thought I was a chronicler. This is the odd sort of solace. This is the odd sort of solace that one might take in the thought of annihilation, the sound of existential dread, the dancing skeleton. Goodbye, humans. Hallelujah. The sound of existential dread is the rattling bones of a dancing skeleton. It's right here on the t-shirt, guys. This is the odd sort of solace that one might take in the thought of annihilation, and it provides an interesting counterpoint to the fist-pounding of long-termists that being extinct would constitute the greatest tragedy imaginable. Just as the thought of nothingness might comfort someone in horrible pain because of a terminal illness, so might the idea that if our extinction does happen, at least this would put an end to the worst things that would otherwise have happened. Wars, torture, genocide, child abuse, and so on. There is no reason to believe that such things won't happen in the future just as they have in the past. The world is messy, and the promise of utopia that many long-termists discuss is an illusion. Those who believe that continuing to exist would be better than being extinct are thus in the awkward position of saying that the worst things listed above are worth risking for future happiness to exist. Some philosophers would say that this is a very difficult position to defend. When I reflect on the views of Benatar, Hartman, Zapfay, Knight, and Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, my thinking tends to follow a certain course. First, I imagine the universe without us. 
A thought that hits me in the gut is a great tragedy. There would be no more laughter, friendship, love, poetry, music, or philosophical contemplation. There would be no more people to gaze up at the firmament at night and marvel at the heavens in wonder and all enraptured by the beauty of it all. Humanity is this little gem in the infinite darkness of space, and to lose that gem would be to deprive the universe of perhaps the most unique thing that it envelops. I feel the pull of this sentiment, not just intellectually, but viscerally. Being extinct would be incredibly sad. But, but, if I shift, if I shift my focus to how much suffering the future will almost certainly contain, I am immediately hit by a profound sense of horror. And I'm assuming he's mostly talking about humans here. That's a very small part. Oh, that's horrible enough. I am talking in, in, in my own philosophical musings. I am talking about uh, the suffering that our fellow earthlings are going to go through at our hands. Uh, I am immediately hit by a profound sense of horror as the influential philosopher Bernard Williams wrote, quote, If for a moment we got anything like an adequate idea of the mountains of misery in our world, then surely we would annihilate the planet if we could. While I strongly disagree, that anyone should ever try to annihilate the planet, that would be omnicide, you know, taking out all of our fellow earthlings along with us. I am not a favor of omnicide. I know some people on YouTube are. Uh, you know, they want to take down our fellow earthlings. I just want to get rid of the humans and, and let our fellow earthlings figure it out without us. But anyway, that would be omnicide and unspeakable evil. The sentiment behind William's statement rings true. What lies ahead is a vast ocean of pain, anguish, trauma, and misery all of which being extinct would erase before the hands of time have a chance to draw it. I can understand why someone would find a smidgen of comfort in this thought, just as someone in extreme pain from a terminal illness might look forward to no longer existing. My guess is that even optimists like Mac Askill can make sense of this perspective, an honest look at what dots the road ahead is to make one want, quote, to vomit or scream or cry, close quote. The vast majority of us are passive spectators in this world. We can, we cannot abolish the nuclear arsenals, force the fossil fuel companies to stop extracting oil from the ground, or make companies like OpenAI put the brakes on building AI. Some philosophers, though, would say, quote, take heart, take heart. If the world comes to pass Take heart that the light of human consciousness also casts a dark shadow. Without the light, there is no shadow, and a world without shadows might 
just be best. There you go, and I've already forgotten the uh, a uh, a man Emil Torres. Let's see if we can get some more bio. Emil Torres is a philosopher and historian whose work focuses on existential threats to civilization and humanity. Um, published on a wide range of topics including machine superintelligence, emerging technologies, and religious eschatology as well as the history of ethics of human extinction. And again, uh, their forthcoming book, I guess Emil Torres, according to Truth Dig, I guess there's two people. Emil and his imaginary friend, a uh, forthcoming book is titled Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation, published by Routledge. And there you go. Maybe uh, we will, if I ever get uh, back to interviewing people, we will have to bring them. We will have to bring Emil and uh, their imaginary friend onto Collapse Chronicles and see if they own the shirt, The Sound of Existential Dread. But I'm going to take my own dancing skeleton uh, and the little dog out to pee. And then uh, we're going to call it a night as we work our way back to New York, baby. Bye, guys. Yes, little dog. Are you ready for human extinction? You say, Papa, I might go hungry if humans go extinct. I might not have anything to eat if you go extinct. <laughs>